Right. And as we're waiting that for that to go on to YouTube yeah. Live, um, I have a quick poll that I wanted to launch to see if we could get some information for the people that we have in this class. So I just launched the poll. If you could take a few seconds to uh, take a look at the questions, that would be fantastic. So I can get an idea of who we have. Interesting. Right about 50-50 for going a car at a concourse. Excellent. The results that I'm showing so far is 78% of you have been to a concourse before. Uh, 47% have shown your car to concourse and 82% have shown your car at a non-concourse show. Interesting. Okay, excellent. Well, now that we have that out of the way and I have a general idea of your um, involvement in concourse shows, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Anne Marie. I am a uh, member of the Orange County section and I am also on the social media committee for NBCA. Before I got onto the social media committee, I uh, created this class along with my friend Jeff Wong, who is um, going to be helping out with this part of the presentation to explain what a concourse is, how you show your car at a concourse, how to prepare your car for a concourse. Um, and so part one of, this is part one of two. Part one, it sounds backwards, but in part one, we're going to explain what a concourse is the judging requirements, uh, what happens at a concourse. We're starting with the end results and then going backwards. So part two is gonna be how to actually plan and prepare for showing your car at the concourse. Um, now that we have that going, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get going. Okay. So once again, in part one of two, we're going to go over. Whoa, we're going to go over what, who are we? Why are we presenting this to you? What is a concourse? The history, the entry classes. What are the judging uh, requirements? What are the judges looking for? Typical deductions. Um, what happens in the modified classes? Silver Star preservation judges rules and then what to expect at the event what you should and shouldn't do field preparation once judging begins after judging and awards and then we'll have um, a q a session if you do have questions please put them into the live chat uh, jeff will be monitoring that so he can take a look and answer any quick questions that you guys have if you have specific questions regarding your situation we'll keep those to the end um, so that we can devote proper time to this so we so we um and make sure that we have enough time for everybody. Um, first off, supporting materials. We have quite a few supporting documents. These are available on, uh, most of them are available on the NBCA website, including the rule book, the concourse judges instructions, the show class scoring sheet, Silver Star preservation scoring sheet, day of show checklist, and Jeff's favorite products and tools. That's not available on the NBCA website, but if you email me at lovemycosworth at gmail.com, I can get links to all of those for you directly. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty handy. I have another email address that's, I recently got married, so the old email address is under my old last name. So this is, this is the best way to reach me, lovemycosworth at gmail.com. Now that we have that out of the way, who are we? So uh, Jeff or Capdruff, as he is known on the forums and Instagram, has been showing his cars at various concourse shows for the last 15 years. If you follow him on Instagram, you know that he has three interests in his life, dogs, cars, and food. Um, if you are a, a Hemings Magazine enthusiast, you might recognize these pictures as he was featured with his 580 and Hemings.
So we are presenting this class today, uh, not only to prepare you for the concourse event, but to also to illustrate that you don't have to have a garage queen or a dedicated show car in order to have a good time at a concourse and to have some success. Uh, these are a few of the awards that Jeff has won over the last 15 years. Uh, they, he has won quite a few, some with dedicated garage show queens, but also with uh, daily drivers. He, he had great results with his 1995 E320 wagon with over 225,000 miles that he has daily driven. Uh, and he's, he's had significant success with that as well. So you don't have to have a dedicated garage queen in order to have a good time in a concourse. So who am I? Uh, again, my name is Anne Marie. I got into Mercedes in 2008 when I first met Jeff and bought my first of four 190E 2.316s from him. I currently have one that is undergoing finally a full nut and bolt restoration with some pretty cool modifications. Uh, my husband, Matt, owns a Mercedes repair and restoration shop here in Garden Grove uh, in Orange County. Um, he focuses on 201s and 124s for concourse shows, but he also does performance modifications, uh, custom parts and, and resto mod builds, the builds that are pretty, pretty unique and out there. So when, when I'm not, when he's not working on my car, he's, uh, he's working on all the cars for his customers, getting them ready for shows. I, since 2013, I've been going to Legends of the Audubon in Monterey, California during Car Week, and uh, I've shown several cars on Jeff's behalf at those shows, and I've also judged there as well. I judged in 2017 and 2018. 2017 was the pre-merger AMG class, and 2018 I judged the featured 201 class. First came up with this idea for this class when Jeff and I actually went to the judging class uh, in San Jose, California a few years ago. And one of the judges said, you know, there's this concourse class, but is there anything for entrance so that they know what to expect, what they should do, what they shouldn't do? And there really wasn't at the time. So we decided to put this class together to demystify the whole process, to make it to get more people and younger people involved and younger cars involved in the concourse scene. So what is a concourse? Miriam Webster has the official definition as a show or contest of vehicles and accessories in which the entries are judged chiefly on excellence of appearance and turnout. Brief history of the concourse. Concourses began officially in around 17th century France uh, when, when the aristocracy would parade their horse-drawn carriages through Paris through the summer. Automobiles took over for the horse-drawn carriages and entire families were judged on their automobiles. Competition was so stiff that entrants in the Rolls-Royce category hired models with designer dresses that coordinated with the interiors of the cars, which I think is just fantastic. They should bring that back. Uh, the first concourse in North America was held at Pebble Beach uh, in Monterey in 1950. And until now, I don't think they had taken a year off. So entry classes, sorry, I have my, my notes here, my talking points to make sure I don't forget anything. Entry classes, each concourse is different. Um, there are different class breakdowns. There are different models that are in different classes. Sometimes German sedans, all German sedans are put in the same class. Sometimes it's just Mercedes specific. So for the today's purposes to make it easy, uh, we're going to use Legends of the Audubon as the example. It's the one that Jeff and I know the most. It's the one that we have the most experience with from an entrant and a judging sign. So uh, here are the entry classes that they have typically at Legends. Um, the marks are judged separately. So Mercedes judges, MBCA judges judge Mercedes. Uh, Audi club judges judge the Audis. And then the BMW club judges judge the BMWs. Um, we have typically seven to eight classes. Every year they tend to have a um, featured class that would end up being class eight, but usually classes one through seven are um, steady throughout. The only difference is, is classes five through six. It's a rolling window of, uh, so that the, every year you can bring a newer, a one year newer car. 
So this year would have, you would have been allowed to bring a 19, uh, up to 1999. What do the judges look for? Judging standards also vary from one event to another. Along with looking up the concourses in your area to make sure that your, core, your car qualifies for a particular class, um, look up the, how the judging will be done. If it's an MBCA event, then they'll use the MBCA rules that are in the rule book, in the 2012 rule book. Um, I believe that's the most recent one. I checked it a few months ago and that was the most recent one. And I don't think there has been an update since then. So take a look at that and then I'll have the judging standards in there. Um, but typically for concourse shows, cars are judged on authenticity, cleanliness, presentation, and functionality. Not all concourses judge functionality, but typically NBCA uh, events do. Authenticity means that there are no aftermarket parts or accessories. Everything is period correct for the car. That includes um, making sure it's period correct, but also market correct. So US cars have US parts, Euro cars have Euro parts. Um, the only area where authenticity is not the highest emphasis is in paint. Resprays are fine, as long as it's in the color that's, that was available for that year in that market. Um, and uh, it had to be the one that came on the car. Otherwise it's a deduction. Um, and that information is found on the metal plate in the front of your car. Um, when it comes to paint, again, authenticity isn't the highest standard. It's um, presentation and cleanliness. So cleanliness is pretty self-explanatory. No dirt, lint, dust, grease, leaking fluid, etc. Presentation is a little harder to define. It's how the car sits on the field, how it looks. Seats should be clean. Nothing should be overly greasy. You shouldn't have swirls all over the paint. You shouldn't have dust everywhere, stuff like that. It, your car should present an overall package well. And then functionality. Again, every, every event is different. Uh, they don't usually test the functionality of every aspect of your car. Uh, it could be, they could ask you to turn on your headlights, switch on your blinkers, press the brake light to make sure that the brake lights are working. They may ask you to turn on your car to actually start your car, uh, or they could ask you to roll down your windows. It's different at every show. Sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't, but it's best to make sure that everything on your car is working just in case. One trick that the judges use that I've used quite, quite a, on quite a few cars is to, when, you, when the judge first gets to the car, they'll take an overview and look at the time on the clock. And then when the, it doesn't matter if the clock is accurate, just, just, they'll just check the time. And then once all the judges are done judging the car, then they'll go back around and see if the time has moved, which means the, the clock is working. And that has been used as a tiebreaker um, on two equally qualified cars. So again, it doesn't matter if the time is accurate, just that it is working. Um, and again, they may not ask for anything. It, you have to be prepared for any possibility. Here is the show class and that's concourse, the concourse show class score sheet. That's a mouthful. Uh, this is what the judges use to actually judge the cars. This is every judge has the sheet and they'll mark uh, the entrance name, the year, the model, paint color, paint code, and the mileage. And then they'll go uh, item by item and marking the deductions, putting in comments, etc. There are five sections on this totaling 100 points. Depending on how many judges are available, the judging team will be divided to handle each section. Again, it depends on how many judges are, are in each class. Uh, if, there are, if there are five sections or five judges, then, then one judge will uh, handle each section. So the, what this means practically is that this evens the playing field. So the same judge for every car in a class is gonna judge the engine compartments. They're not gonna do engine on, on one car, paint coach work on another car. It's the one judge is going to handle the engine compartments for all of the cars within that class. That means that deductions will be more even across the board 
and make it for fairer judging. So here's the second page of the score sheet. Again, there's interior upholstery trunk, glass lights, rubber trim, chassis and underbody, and then you have the point summary at the bottom. Um, once the deductions are tallied up, they're put on the bottom and then the grand total is given and the car with the most points wins. Again, each car starts at 100 points and deductions are given from there. You don't earn points, you can only lose them. In the case of a tie, this is actually contrary to what most people think. In the case of a tie, the higher mileage car wins, not the lower mileage car. Scoring guidelines. And by the way, all of these pictures are either taken by me or Jeff or somebody that we know who has authorized us to use them. This, this is just one of Jeff's cars. Uh, and this, these are the judges that were there. So I hope you enjoy some of the pictures that we've chosen for this. Again, all cars start at 100 points. A perfect car will be a 100 point car and will receive no deductions. The goal in showing your car at a concourse is to present your car as it rolled out of the factory, not necessarily out of the dealership, which is which we'll go into later on. No extra points are awarded. Judging is not an exact science. Uh, it, judging standards vary from show to show and from class to class within each show, but ultimately it is the judge's goal that the best car wins. Uh, deductions in each category are made in quarter point, half point, and one point increments, depending on how severe the, uh, the flaw or the modification is. Usually a minor flaw like a swirl on a paint or dust on the seats or a slight tear in the upholstery will be a, a quarter to a half a point, um, but multiple deductions will occur uh, with multiple with multiple in issues. So if you have checking across the entire paint, then that could be something that's deducted more towards a full point or even more, um, depending on how these, how these add up. Judges are advised to be consistent across the board in the application of deductions. Um, so that again, it's, it's standard across the class. It might be different from one class to another class, depending on how the judges are but it should be consistent within each class. Deductions are given when a, a part is not OE, but also when a part is not period correct. So if a North American car has European headlights, then that's a deduction, but a European car with European headlights would not receive a deduction. This becomes difficult for judges when cars have running changes. Uh, sometimes it can be tricky to differentiate between pre and post facelift cars, uh, that, that becomes trickier, but to make sure if you have a pre-facelift car that you have pre-facelift parts. Judging is a human process. Uh, judges do make mistakes. Uh, they, it, it's, it's difficult to be an expert in every model that could possibly show up at a class, at a concourse. So it's, if, be more knowledgeable in your car than the judges are so that if they do deduct for something that you can step in and say, or they point something out or question something, you can step in and say, no, this is accurate. This is correct. And here is why. Um, at Legends, judges aren't assigned to classes until the day of the show. And they also don't have access to the uh, cars that are going to be attending which does make it more difficult for us. If we had a cheat sheet of who was gonna show up ahead of time, then we could do a, uh, more thorough research. Uh, we try to be as knowledgeable as we can to the cars that will potentially be there. Um, but knowing what didn't did, did not come on your car is, is the best way to go about it. And don't be afraid to, to correct the judges if they have something that I identified as a deduction that shouldn't be. So next, oops, there we go. OE versus OEM versus aftermarket. Now we could go off on, on a tangent on this for a very long time, but I'm gonna make some quick uh, points regarding each one to explain the difference and why some could get deductions and others can't. OE stands for original equipment, which means that it is a Mercedes-Benz factory part. It has a Mercedes-Benz star on it and the manufacturer's label. 
the uh, radiator on the left, <clears throat> excuse me, the radiator, <coughs> excuse me, radiator on the left is a OE part. It's kind of hard to see, but below the white sticker with the red dot is a Mercedes star that is drilled into the actual radiator. The radiator in the middle is OEM. OEM is original equipment manufacturer. So this is generally made by the same manufacturer who creates the OE part for Mercedes that Mercedes then stamps their star on, but it does not have the star. So you can see in the middle photo, the little bit of putty below the green, uh, the green sticker, that is where the Mercedes-Benz star was puttied over. So this, is, this was sold by Bayer. It is not a um, OE part, it is an OEM part doesn't mean it's not a quality product. It's the same product. It just doesn't have the Mercedes-Benz star on it, or sometimes it's a sticker, sometimes it's ground in. Uh, it, all, it all depends on what the part is. OEM parts can receive deductions. Um, the rule book is a little bit vague on this, but typically OEM parts do receive deductions versus OE parts. This is, again, tricky when stuff is no longer available and it's only available through the manufacturer versus through Mercedes. In that instance, you can explain to the judges, look, I would have an OE part if I could, but then the Mercedes no longer makes it. They no longer offer it. So that's why I had to get the OEM part. The radiator on the right is OE, is neither OE nor OEM. The radiator on the right is completely aftermarket. It is, made, it is made by somebody other than the original equipment manufacturer. So the, again, the difference between the three is the, the aftermarket part will definitely receive a deduction versus the OEM part, which could and the OE part, which will not receive deductions. Uh, judges can only deduct for what they see. So this is a very obvious example to a judge who knows this car um, that to, to know to look for the Mercedes-Benz star. This isn't always the case. In the 500E, it's hidden. So unless you pull out the shroud, you can't see it if it has a star on it or not. So this we'll get into this later on and you know where you want to spend your money and choosing your deductions wisely uh, knowing knowing what deductions your car has and how to address them this is something in a, in a 201 you're definitely going to want to address because this is really obvious to the judges if they know what they're looking at they will deduct for this to, so make sure that you have an oe or an oem part um in a perfect world, obviously, you'd have OE across the board and have a perfect show car, but let's be realistic. That's not always possible. Stuff gets made no longer available. It, parts get superseded. It, it's, a, it's complicated for, rest, for restoring um, cars. So, you know, you got to do what you can and work with what you've got. Another example here of OE versus OEM is this radiator cap. Again, the one on the top is a Mercedes-Benz part. It has a Mercedes-Benz star on it. The radiator on the cap on the bottom is, um, is, a, oh, is made by the same manufacturer, but does not have the star. And I just realized I called those radiators. Those are condensers. No, those are radiators. Those are radiators. Yeah, sorry. I got confused in here. I had, I had something else written different. Never mind. A lot of my mind here. Okay, next factory versus dealership installed options. Now here's again where we can go on a tangent for quite a while. There is a difference between factory and dealership installed. Depending on the judges that you have at your event, dealership installed options could be considered a deduction. Again, it depends on who's there and what the judging standards that are agreed on. Uh, this, these include pinstripes, which I know is a controversial one, but also chrome wheels and car alarms. Pinstripes are hard because a lot of times they're they're under the uh, clear coat, so there's nothing really you can do about it. But if they um, if the judges determine that they are going to deduct for dealership installed options, then that will be a deduction. 
aftermarket kits and accessories. So car tuners like uh, Lorenzer, Brabus, Wald, et cetera, those are not factory. They are considered deductions. That doesn't mean that it's there's anything wrong with doing that. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have that on your car, but if you're gonna show it at a concourse, in a concourse class, expect that you will receive deductions for, uh, for those items. If you do have a full Lorenzer kit or if you have a car from Lorenzer, then best to put it in modified class. If, if you wanna put it in the show class, go for it, please do. But do be aware that that will be considered a deduction. Accessories, even from the factory accessory catalog should not be shown in the car generally. So this includes um, luggage sets. We see that a lot. Luggage sets just keep the judges from looking at your actual carpets, your actual trunk, your actual car itself. Uh, they're cool, they're awesome, put them next to the car, but during judging, let the, let the judges be able to see your car as it sits without the accessories. It couldn't, again, it's not always considered a deduction. If we see it, we'll just ask you to take it out anyway. So it's, it's best to just leave them at home or take them out prior to judging. Again, we wanna be able to see, actually see your carbon. This includes floor mats. So floor mats uh, will, factory floor mats, you can, we will ask you to pull them up so we can see them. You can leave the floor mats in the car uh, while, the, while the judges judge, but they will ask you to pull up your floor mats so they can see the actual carpet. Okay, let's see. Again, with the accessories, especially the factory ones, you don't get extra points in concourse shows. So having those luggage sets, having you know anything like that is not gonna is not gonna help your cause. Uh, they may not be deductions, but generally it, it's it's best to leave those at home or take them out prior to judging. Modified class. So the same judging guidelines apply for the modified class as they apply to the concourse class. The only difference is, is that in the modified class, the judges won't deduct for non-period correct or aftermarket modifications. So, uh, but, but all the other judging standards apply. Patina is discouraged and will be deducted. Modifications should be well executed though. That is the one key thing. If you do have a car that you're putting into a modified class, Make sure the modifications are clean, nicely done. Um, it, presentation, and that's where the presentation comes in. Presentation is still key when it comes to modified class. It should look well done. Um, and again, cleanliness, make sure your car is super clean. We'll go into, in part two, we'll go into a how to thoroughly clean your car. Uh, but, but that's, especially in the modified class because you have one fewer category to be deducted for, which is authenticity. So you're not deducting for that. So judges will look at other things to um, break up the, the cars and be able to rank them. So the last class that is available through MBCA is the Silver Star Preservation class. Um, I'm not as knowledgeable about this class as I am about the others, but I do have several friends who have presented their cars in Silver Star Preservation and one who was judged. So they gave me some, some tips on this. So I'll run through them real quick. Uh, it's not at all NBC events, but the ones that do offer them, it's a really good opportunity for cars that are um, mostly original, 25 years or older, driver quality, non-restored cars. Uh, it's not supposed to be for trailer queens or barn finds that don't operate. Um, they, but it, it is a good opportunity for those cars to be shown and uh, rewarded for their authenticity. So part of the requirements for Silver Star is that again, it's 25 years or older, largely original, non-restored, uh, original engine and drivetrain is uh, not required, but preferred. Partial refurbishments for various components can be performed, but uh, this, this is not the class for a full restoration. So the cars in the Silver Star are self-judged by the entrance following the Silver Star preservation score sheet, which we'll show in the next slide. 
Um, this includes noting which aspects of the car are original and which aspects have been altered. So you should know what is original and what is altered on your car as you are filling out the score sheet. Then the class judge, uh, who was assigned by the chief judge, will review the completed form with the entrant and evaluate every aspect of the car. If the car is earned enough points to be certified, the chief judge and the class judge will verify the findings and initial the form. So again, here's the score sheet. It has all of the relevant information that you need and then you need 60% in all categories for certification as a Silver Star preservation car. So once that is all completed, again, here's the second page of the sheet, points awarded at the end. The uh, judge will take a photo of the car and complete and send it with the completed certification to the NBCA National Business Office. They will create and send a official Silver Star certificate formally declaring the car to have met the standards of the Silver Star preservation class. Uh, they also have grill badges through the um, NBCA website that you can purchase once you have uh, the Silver Star certificate. And it's a really cool class to allow for the not non-true concourse cars. So now what are the judges rules? So there, we're gonna go into plenty of what you should and shouldn't do, but first let's go into what the judges should and shouldn't do. Rule number one, and this is a huge pet peeve for me personally, judges cannot touch your car. They cannot touch your car. They cannot enter your car. They cannot touch your car unless you let them. They have to ask permission. And generally they shouldn't even be asking permission. So if they need to open a door, they will ask you, Mr. or Ms. Entrant, can you please open the car door? Can you please pop the trunk? Can you please pop the hood? Can you turn on the car? Stuff like that. The judges will ask you to do it. And don't be afraid to stand up to them and say, hey, the rule book says you can't do that. Please don't touch my car. I've done it to judges. It's, it's something that I think is very important as, as, a, as a judge that we respect the entrance cars. So the judges, again, they can ask you to open your doors, hoods, trunks, etc. can ask you to perform functionality tests, and they can ask you questions about your car. So prepare to be knowledgeable. Okay, you are at a concourse, now what? <laughs> what should you do? Number one, arrive early. Evaluate the weather situation. This one is big, especially in Monterey because it's uh, the Bay Area gets pretty foggy in the mornings. And if you get there too early and start wiping your car immediately, you're just gonna get more, uh, more dew on your car. You're gonna have to do it all over again. And it doesn't, it's, it's not a good situation. So evaluate the weather situation and how it, how it involves, uh, how it relates to your preparation. If you're in a totally opposite situation where you're in Arizona or somewhere else really hot and dry, and it's gonna be super sunny in just 20 minutes, then get started early and start wiping your, or your car down. Um, again, this will, this will determine your entire preparation run for your car for, prior to judging. Uh, if it's gonna be, it's gonna be a long day. So bring some folding chairs, some shades, some water bottles, stuff like that. Uh, it'll make for a, for a better day. Be available for the judge and give them their full attention. This one is, this one is a big one. Uh, a lot of times early in the morning because judging does start pretty early. Um, other people who are walking around who are just uh, participants or observers may want to ask you questions about your car, which is great. Um, Talk to as many people as you can about your car. But the one time you have to say, I'm sorry, come back in 10 minutes, my car is being judged right now, is when your car is being judged. You want to give the judges your full attention. There's not a lot of time to judge each car. Um, I think we had five or six minutes a car in 2018 because we had 30 cars in the class. It was a very, very tight schedule. So make sure that you are giving them your full attention. Also, judges are volunteering. They don't get paid. Uh, so time, to their time is valuable. Uh, make, make sure that they're not having to chase you down. When the, there will be a towels down um, announcement made so that you know when judging is about to start. 
make sure that you're by your car waiting for the judges. Normally they're start at one end of the, of the class and work their way car, down car by car. So you can kind of see how far away they are. But that's, that's the most important part as an entrant during judging is to be at your car so we don't have to go find you. And then after your car is judged, meet the other entrants, meet the other people in your class, exchange tips and tricks and uh, meet the other people. And it's honestly, that's the best part for me of showing a car at a concourse is meeting the other people and, and at Legends, because usually it's, this, it's the same group of people plus or minus a few that come every year and show different cars, you, you get to know people over the years. And it's, it's really great to build those relationships with other people, especially since uh, for most people, a car show like Legends is outside of your section. That way you can, you can meet people in sections other than your own. That's, that's a huge one for me. Okay. And then obviously most important, the whole reason why they're doing this is not necessarily for the awards. While the awards are great, what you're really doing is just trying to have fun. Enjoy your car. Enjoy people who are enjoying your car. That's, that's the main part. Have fun. What shouldn't you do? Here's, here's one where especially first time uh, entrants get a little focused on. They, they start paying attention too much to what other people are and aren't doing. And this is one where you got to stay in your own lane. Be prepared, know what you want to do, and don't get distracted when the guy two cars down from you is washing their car on the field. Believe me, I've seen it. <laughs> it's That works for him. It may not necessarily work for you. You know your car. You've prepared. The, focus on what you're doing and before judging. And then afterwards, say, hey, you know, why do you, why do, I saw you doing this. Why were you doing that? How do you like that product or something like that? That's the time to, to interact with people. Uh, also, don't display, display miscellaneous documentation regarding your car until after judging. This one is the, also a pretty big pet peeve of mine um, as a judge. It's, we love to see stuff like that, especially you know, people have posters made up or you know, if your car was featured in a magazine, that's awesome. We love seeing that stuff, but not during judging. Put that stuff out after the judging has been completed. It doesn't give you extra points. It just distracts us from being able to look at your car, especially if you start displaying that stuff on your dashboard. We're just gonna ask you to take it out. So it's best to keep that stuff off to the side until after judging is over, then you can display whatever you want. And honestly, it's cool to see that stuff after because you, you get a better idea of the history of the car or the significance of the car. Uh, but again, not, not when judging is, is happening. Don't overly engage with the judges. Don't hover over them. Don't say, hey, hey, look at this, or hey, point that out, or hey, did you see this? Just let them do what they're going to do. They'll ask questions. If you see them pointing out something that they shouldn't be or questioning something, then by all means, step in. But the best way to be an entrant is to... Uh, be available to them, be focused on them, but not hovering and uh, interacting with them overly. Another one, don't stress out. I, Jeff stresses out. He, he turns into a totally different person when it's pre-judging. I know he's gonna do it and he does it every year, but don't stress out. At the end of the day, it's just a car show. You're there to have fun. You're there to meet people. That You're there to show off your car but this isn't the end of the world. It's, it's just a car show, have fun. And the last thing is don't leave the show early because you can win something. I've had to chase, I, this wasn't at a concourse show. This was just uh, at, at, a, at a local show that we had a couple of years ago where one of the guys was leaving early and I had to literally run after him, chase him down the street and said, hey, you're winning an award, turn around <laughs> because he had left early. So don't leave early. I, one, it, it, you want to be a good sport and support the other people in your class, but also you could win something. So you never, you, you never know. Okay, field preparation. So here's when we start getting into some of the, uh, the nitty gritty on how to actually prepare your car. Again, part two of this class is going to be really the long-term planning, 12 months, six months, three months, 
um, than day of stuff. But th this is really when you park your car on the grass or in the parking lot, when, wherever the event is. Normally it's on grass or golf course. So can we have everybody mute? Thank you. Uh, once you, so this is once you have actually arrived and parked your car on the field. Again, uh, arrive early. Um, oh, by the way, this is there is a multi-page checklist that Jeff created for a friend of ours who was showing his car for the first time. It is extremely step by step. This is what you need to do um, for for how to on field prep your car. And if you want that again, email me. Um, my, my email will be at the end. We'll show all of our contact information so you can reach out to us. But uh, we have a, I, I pulled out a couple of key points um, from, from the checklist that I think are important. First thing, again, arrive early. Then open your hood to cool the engine. Close it prior to judging. Once you've done your final wipe down, close the hood. You want to present the car uh, closed. So no open doors, no open hood, no open trunk. Uh, and then take a moment, just, just relax and breathe and take in uh, your environment, see where you are in the field, uh, take a look at the cars around you, just, just take a moment to breathe. There's going to be plenty of time to stress out. I know I said don't stress, but everybody does. Uh, so, but take, take a few minutes. Now, once you're ready to go, remove non-essential items from the car, including everything in the trunk. We had a couple people in the 201 class in 2018 who had never shown their cars before and didn't know that we'd be looking in their trunks. So they had uh, strollers and baby bags and all the whole nine yards. And I mean, more power to them. They, they, it was a husband and wife and their baby who came and it was awesome to see that, uh, especially as a first time entrant, but ooh, <laughs> we had to say, hey, can you take a, take a few minutes and get all the stuff out of your trunk? Because he had no idea that we'd be looking in there. So. Uh, sometimes it's the little things like this that can trip you up and kind of set you off on the wrong foot. So remove all non-essential items. Um, things that you should leave in your car though, um, your toolkit, first aid kit, um, stuff like that, your spare tire, your spare, your spare wheel and tire, leave that stuff in the car. But any bags that you came with, folding chairs, coolers, whatever, stuff like that, non-essential items, leave those out of the car. Then you're gonna do a wipe down of your interior and exterior. Uh, people have all sorts of different products that they like for stuff like that. Um, you, in this picture, this is Jeff with his wagon with a Costco microfiber in his hand and another one in his back pocket. Uh, this, this is his typical uh, pre-show wipe down. One thing that a lot of people forget to do is to wipe down your tires, especially if you are um, at a show that is on a golf course. A lot of times you're going there early in the morning, the water, there's still water on the grass, there's leaves and blades of grass all over the place. So your tires will get dirty. Do a final wipe down once you've set your car for final placement, wipe down your tires. It, means, it makes for, it, it's not as, I'm not saying you're going to get a deduction for it, but again, this goes to the overall presentation of your car. The best play that you have is to, to put your best foot forward, wipe down your tires. It's something that a lot of people forget. And then once again, double check that your car is empty. Seriously, double check everything. Once judging begins, so there's going to be, again, there's going to be a uh, announcement made for towels down. That, that means that judging is about to start and you need to be available for the judges. Um, when the judges ask you, put your hood in the service position. They'll ask you to uh, open your trunk to inspect the spare wheel, check for jack and tools. Um, depending on where it is, they may ask you to um, show them the first aid kit and or the battery if they can see it. Um, if it's in the, if it's in the trunk and it's so easily accessible, sometimes it's under the seat and you can't do it. So obviously they're not going to ask for it because it's not accessible. Um, but if it's accessible, they will, they will ask to see it. And then again, they may ask you to perform functionality tests to make sure everything is working. Um, and they will answer, they want you to answer any questions about the car that they have to the best of your ability. They also may ask if an item was a factory item. 
it's in fact we option i should say especially for stuff like fire extinguishers or warning triangles which are uh, standard equipment in europe or older cars but were not standard equipment for the united states market so especially stuff like warning triangles and fire extinguishers uh, don't have them in u.s cars if they were not for if they are not for the market specifications but if they were in if they were in europe you should have them make sure that you have them because if you don't they um they will be deductions but if the judge wants to deduct for something like that and it is if your car is euro and it does have that and they try to deduct for it just point it out and say hey this was european standard equipment and period correct correct for my car so it should be after judging so again here's a here's a uh, photo of the filled out concourse show score sheet show class score sheet that one <laughs> told you it's a mouthful so this is a uh, photo of one that was on one of Jeff's cars a few years ago. Um, the, they will sometimes collect them automatically, but other times they are left on the car. So if you're lucky, you can take a snapshot like I did to see what deductions you had. Um, but the judging sheet is sometimes left on the car, but then the chief judge will walk around all of the cars and pick them all up. Then the scores are tallied um, and in um, the the chief judge will make sure that the awards are um, that the class winners are tallied and then once that happens you have no obligations relax enjoy the show talk to the people around you talk to the people who uh, stopped by your car and you had to say hey come back in 10 minutes go find those people talk to them uh, you usually have a, a few hours before the awards um, sometimes they provide lunch, sometimes there's food trucks, it all depends on the show, um, but there, at the end there are awards and then photos. So at Legends, they take the first three class winners along with the best of mark and best of show cars and they pull them aside so that the photos can be taken for the Star Magazine. So don't just drive off <laughs> because you have your award. Make sure you get your photo taken for the Star. It's, they always have a good spread. Um, okay, again, don't leave. <laughs> you might miss out on something. So awards, again, every show is different. I keep on saying this and it, it, it's hard to, to create a class like this that covers every potential possibility. Uh, but in this case for, for Legends, uh, the three marks, Mercedes, uh, BMW and Audi each provide uh, winners for each class. So they have a first place, second place, and third place in each class. And then a best of mark car is determined from all of the first in class winners. Uh, and that car is awarded best of mark. And then the head judge of the uh, of MBCA, the head judge of the Audi club and the head judge of the BMW club meet together and between them, uh, they determine the best of show car. And uh, they determine that from the three best of mark cars. Modified cars are not eligible for the best of mark or best of show awards as far as NBCA is concerned. That isn't necessarily true for other car clubs because they have their own different rules. But as far as NBCA goes, um, generally best of, um, best of class modified cars are not eligible for best of mark or best of show. But hey, you still get an award, so that's always good. Now, uh, that is the end of the first part of our presentation. Here is what you can expect in part two. Part two will be on October 8th at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, here is where we'll go into the step-by-step, -step, here's what you do to prepare for a concourse. Um, we go over to a six to 12 months or more sometimes before the event. I mean, I, I've been in a process of restoring my car for the last 10 years. So, you know, every timeline is different, uh, but generally the, the things that apply to the six to 12 months apply in longer timelines as well. That's long-term planning. Then you have medium-term planning one to two months before the event. You have real short-term one to two days before the event and then at the event itself. Uh, 
Um, and then preparing your car. This is where we get into the actual how to prepare your engine compartment, your paint and coach work, interior upholstery, trunk, glass lights, rubber trim, chassis, and underbody. Um, what, what you should do to address each of these issues to uh, minimize your deductions. But again, we want to emphasize that you need to plan this journey wisely, maximize your resources. It's not about outspending everybody. Be smart. Um, and, and plan properly for your success. And again, that's, that will be in part two. Um, we have presented this class several times in person, Jeff and I have, and it ends up being a three and a half hour class. <laughs> I honestly, I don't even know what time it is or how long we've been going, but we, we needed to split this, this class up. Otherwise the East Coast people would be falling asleep on us and we didn't want that to happen. Um, but if we hope you join us for part two, now is where we get into the questions. While we do that, I'm just going to leave this contact screen up. You can contact me at lovemycauseworth at gmail.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram at lovemycauseworth. And then Jeff, you can find him at capdruff at gmail or Instagram at capdruff. And he's also on the 500 e and 190 rev boards as capdruff. So if you have any questions for us, you can put them in the chat. Uh, we would love to answer them. What kind of questions? Well, actually, you didn't get a lot of questions, Anne Marie. Um, okay. So, but I did want to add one thing uh, relative to uh, what you're talking about. The uh, in showing the cars, um, it's a in judging the cars. I should say on the other side, it's a very human process. Um, I've, you know, I have certain expectations in preparing my cars and I've been in shows where, you know, I've been disappointed. I thought I did, you know, I did the best I could and the car stood in place, but, uh, it doesn't keep me, it just, uh, disappointed. Yes. But will I show the car again? You know, in all, in all likelihood, yes, I will. Um, when you do get a deductions, uh, a lot of times you have access to the, um, to you'll know why you got a deductions. And other times the score sheets, if they get taken away, um, if, you, if you're not looking specifically, if you're not actually speaking to the judges, you may not know why or what de deductions you got um, or deductions you received. So it's kind of important. Judges are very busy. So it's not as if you're gonna be able to have a full discussion specific to your car and why you got certain deductions on your car vis-a-vis -vis another car. Um, uh, because there's so many time limitations. So uh, to expect to have a full conversation with one or two of the judges, um, that might be a little bit, uh, that has not been the case in my experience to be able to have one-on-ones. Uh, and that would be in a perfect world, sure. But in reality, I haven't seen it. Um, in terms of uh, challenging deductions, I've seen it. I've seen problems on the field in terms of entrance challenging the fairness of judging. I've seen it one time. Uh, it wasn't, um, I just kind of stayed away from it uh, personally as another entrant. Uh, but they did, um, again, it was time factor. He wanted to get the uh, chief judge involved. Uh, they called for the chief judge. I'm not so sure that actually ever, uh, they had the time to actually get that judge involved. Uh, in the end, uh, that individual, I think, still placed in the top three. But uh, again, he was disappointed. Uh, there's a couple more questions coming in. Yeah, so I'm, along those lines, the biggest, as a judge, the hardest part of judging is the time limitation. Judge concourse shows are so chaotic from, from the judging standpoint in that there's not a lot of time. Uh, it, it, we don't have walkie talkies to be able to find where the chief judge is. Um, so we may not be able to find him or her or be able to quickly get an, a resolution to an issue. So um, I, I agree that challenging a deduction should be done with the chief judge, but realistically that does not always happen. 
um, what more often than not happens is that the lead judge, oh, Zoe says hi, my whip it. Uh, the lead judge for the class will be the person who ends up adjudicating that issue, not always the chief judge. It, in a perfect world, it would be the chief judge, and that is what the rule book says, but um, that isn't, and that doesn't always realistically happen. Okay, Amber, there's a couple of specific questions that came in. For example, the date and time for part two is going to be October 8th. That's is that correct? October 8th, yes. And you can find that information on our social media calendar on the MBCA website. If you search mbca.org, uh, and then I think it's slash SMC, uh, or just Google social media committee MBCA calendar, it'll show up. Okay, there was another question with regard to concourse versus street class. Uh, there's really, um, there's concourse class and, well, I guess what they call street class or street concourse. They're both concourses. So the rule, there's not, although it makes it sound like there's two different classes, it's, it really uh, is the same. Um, it, that kind of threw me for a loop when I actually was going to enter my car in 2008 at Starfest. Uh, there was a, uh, as I entered my car, um, I, I didn't know which one to enter in, um, but it was uh, at the end when we got to the field, they were all, um, they didn't make the deal, they didn't make the distinction on the field. Uh, yeah. That's a little bit different when we talk about, um, about the modified class. Um, modified class is something that's strictly not a concourse but they're applying some of the same basic ideas of the concourse in terms of cleanliness uh, execution. And that's another reason why when it comes to BMW, um, they also do a version, they don't call it modified, they call it this clean class and the super clean classes uh, for BMW. They have their own rules on how they, how they uh, judge those classes. But again, the idea is I should say this for the concourses as well as whether it's uh, all the all the shows that I go to. The idea is the best car is supposed to win. And again, being a human process, um, sometimes not you know not always does the best car win on a given day um, because the human process mistakes are made. Uh, but the idea is you know the whole idea of this whole concourse and the judging is that the best cars win. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to say that I, I didn't want to interrupt Anne Marie earlier. No worries. Thank you, Jeff. Um, one question that we had was, do you think there's an overemphasis on cleanliness, but a lack of expert analysis on underhood assessment within NBCA judging? If so, how could this be corrected in the future? That is, yes, I do. I'll, I'll agree. That's that's not to say that cleanliness isn't important because it is. And there are a lot of things that we'll go in on the second part of our presentation on where you can maximize your, your points. Uh, again, you don't earn points, but you can maximize the amount of points that you, or minimize the amount of deductions that you have by properly cleaning your car. Stuff like door jams, uh, the, the door sills, stuff like that where dirt and grime are easily collected that is so easy to clean yourself to make sure that you don't lose those points. Um, it, and again, we don't have a lot of time. A lot of time it's under 10 minutes a car. And I know that sounds like a lot of time, but it really is not. It, it, you're going so fast through these cars to make sure that you get to everybody and give everybody the same amount of time. So the first guy gets, doesn't get 20 minutes and the last guy only gets five. Uh, I say guy, guy or gal, uh, because there are some of us gals out there too. Um, at the same time, I do think that there is judges need to be more informed and better educated in the cars that they are judging. At the end of the day, it is the judge's responsibility to make sure that they know what they are doing. And I say that as a judge, it is difficult. A lot of the times on these shows when we don't know the specific cars that are coming to the class, we don't know what, what classes we're going to be judging. That is a lot of times determined the morning of when we get there. 
Uh, we can be as, we are more knowledgeable than most and some people are genuine experts in all the cars that will show up in the class that they're, that they're judging. There, there are judges like that out there. But I think that the entire process could be better managed to set the judges up for success, uh, which would mean that mistakes are um, less likely to occur. But I, I do agree that especially when it comes to engine compartment issues, yeah, better better education on the judge on for the judges and better support for the judges so that we know what's showing up, what we need to be looking at. Because if we know two three months ahead of time what's going to be there, then we can do all the research that we need so that when we show up and say, "Hey, I researched this car, this model, this year because I knew this car was showing up, and I know that that is inaccurate," I, I do think that that would. Uh, really help judges make be better informed to make better judging calls. So, yes, I do think that is an issue. Okay. Uh, also, I'm sorry to interrupt, Emory. Uh, no, Nancy at, was asking about pinstriping. Uh, pinstriping typically a dealer installed options. Um, I agreed. A lot of the cars were pinstriped at the dealer, uh, so customer end customers did not necessarily have a say. Um, typically if I were a judge and I haven't just, I haven't been on the other side, I haven't judged cars, but as a judge, if I were to judge and I saw a car with a pinstripe, personally, I would, I would notice it. Would it constitute a deduction in my eyes? Possibly depending how I felt, uh, it would probably be only a quarter point deduction. If I were to deduct one car for a pinstripe, um, then yes, I'd be consistent and all cars with pinstripes would get deductions. So would that favor a car without a pinstripe? Effectively, yes. But and that's just me, per I'm just speaking personally how I, my feeling on that. Yeah, and that goes along the lines, usually there's more separation between the cars. Not, not always, because sometimes there are very close uh, classes as far as the points break down from one car to another, but th that is something that can be uh, used as a tiebreaker in that kind of scenario. It, again, we're not, we are not saying that you need to remove the pinstriping from your car. We are not saying that you need to change uh, modifications that you like, that you want on your car. I have, I, in my resto mod, it is heavily modified because that's how I want it to be. And I'm going to show it. And I know going in that those are the deductions that I'm going to take. But because I know that, I'm going to make sure that other areas are top notch, that there are no deductions that could be possibly taken. So uh, again, what we're trying to do with these classes is to show you, you don't have to have a garage queen. You don't have to have a perfect car to be successful. There are plenty of imperfect cars who do very well at shows. And just because you get a deduction for something doesn't mean your car is less worthy or um, isn't good enough because it is because it's there. Um, but the purpose of saying that is so that you are aware that that is a possibility. It, again, it's, it varies from show to show, from class to class. It's not always gonna be considered a deduction, but if though if that set of judges on that given in that given day decides that it is a deduction, now you know why you got it. Um, another question that we got was how do judges feel about things like R134 conversions? Um, I haven't seen deductions for that. Well, okay, I, I can I'll, I'll speak to that real quick. On one of my cars, um, we did do a 134. It's it came with R12. Uh, I had Matt do a one thirty. I I had him do the conversion to one thirty four, which meant, you know, new expansion valve, receiver dryer, condenser, all that kind of stuff was done. But to make it less obvious that it was converted to one thirty four was after all the parts were changed. We filled the system with one thirty four, but we took the. Um, I don't have. It's not as obvious because the. Um, the 134 uh, attachments that go how you fill the system, we didn't. We put them on temporarily to fill the system with 134, then we took them back off. So it looks to the untrained eye, or even to the trained eye, 
it looks like it has R12. I just know mentally, and I, you know, that my personal car that's filled with 134 and R1 instead of R12. So that's one way around it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily volunteer that information. It's not a secret, but I'm not advertising that it's been con converted either. There's no stickers on the radiator core support saying that I did the conversion. I just left it off. Excellent, thanks, Jeff. Um, next question we got, currently restoring a couple driver quality uh, plus MVs, trying to use good, not perfect OEM parts from parts salvage cars versus using new OE parts in general, is this a good strategy? Thanks, George. I wanna make sure that um, I have that correct. So you want to use OEM, which is non-Mercedes, but still uh, original equipment manufacturer, non-Mercedes starred parts from salvage cars versus buying factory parts from the dealership. Just want to... Um, clarify that real quick. Okay. Either, either way, here's, here's what I would do. If the part is OE available from Mercedes Benz, unless it is prohibitively expensive in some kind, some cases it is, I would get the OE part. This isn't always possible. A lot of times parts are no longer available. In that case, a good condition working part uh, it, again, it depends on what it is, if it's mechanical or electrical, and it's sometimes used isn't better. But if the, if the part is available um, from a salvage or parts car, go for it. Uh, especially if it's no longer available from the dealership, that's, um, that is definitely the way to go, both from a um, resources standpoint, which we'll go into in part two of our class, you know, making sure that you manage your resources effectively, but also um, making sure that you take deductions smart, the smart way. <laughs> uh, no, go into it knowing certain things that you're going to take deductions on and, and addressing the things that are, that are bigger number value, not necessarily dollar value. Um, oh, got OE and OEM backwards. That's okay. Everybody does. That's why we had a whole slideshow about it. Uh, a whole slide dedicated to the difference between OE and OEM. Everybody gets it wrong. Everybody thinks it's the same thing. Not everybody, but a, a lot of people do. It's, it's very common. So that's why I wanted to make sure that I was understanding your question correctly. Emery, uh, I want to answer the last question that, came, that just came in. Uh, Dennis, there was a question with regards to replacement tires. Um, a lot of times original equipment tires are, not, are no longer available. So what they're going to look for is they're going to look. They're going to make. They want to see four matching tires, at least the four tires that are on the car to be matching. If your original spare tire is original on your spare wheel that's in the trunk, that does not have to be the same brand of the other four. Wouldn't hurt, but it does not have to be the same brand. Yeah, that's that's key. So if you have four Yokohamas but you have your original tire on your original spare tire is a Michelin, then that is okay. That will not be a deduction. But the flip side of that is if you have um, your, if your spare has been down, if it's been used and you replace the tire on your spare and then that is now Yokohama, then your other four tires have to match. If the five don't match because your spare has been down, uh, then that will be considered a deduction. So that's that's a really that's a really good question because that is something that is a super easy deduction for judges to take. Um, it's it's something that's really visible, and and that all the judges know about. So again, if your spare has not been down and it is original, then it is okay to have mismatched tires. If it has been down, then they need to all match. And I hope, I hope that uh, matching dates of manufacturing month and year, no, they don't look that close. They're not going to look that closely on, on something like that. We, we have and on some of the older cars, you don't even have the uh, DOT manufacturer date. So they wouldn't be able to help. I mean, to, to be honest, we've got more important things to look at than the manufacturing date on tires. Uh, there, there's a lot, a lot 
better ways we could as judges can be using our time versus that I, I have not ever seen a deduction for that when I was showing Jeff's cars or when I was judging uh, that that's not something but again mismatched if your spare has been down that will definitely be a deduction and I hope that answers um, I hope that answers that question Dennis now scrolling back up to see what other questions we had. Um, hard top versus soft top, which should you have on? Ooh, um, Jeff, do you have any opinions about that? I don't- It's a, good, it's a, it's a fair, it's a good question. I don't have the, I, I, honestly, I don't have, I've not shown a convertible car. So I, I, I read in the rule book that you could be shown either way. It can be shown with that. It, that if you want to show, I believe it's in the rule book that if you want to show um, with uh, without the hard top, I believe that you show it with the with the rag top down. They may ask for a functionality test of showing the the soft top going up, but the hard top does not have to be with the car at the show. I believe that's the rule. I could be wrong. I have to check on that. I, if my memory serves, that is correct as well. The, I do know that that is in the rule book. Uh, if you if you want the rule book, you can either search for it on the website or you can email me and I can shoot you a copy of it. Uh, but I, I'm almost positive that that is addressed in the rule book as far as uh, hard top and soft top. And, and like Jeff says, if you do have it with the soft top, that is something that could be um, addressed as a functionality standard. So if, if your soft top doesn't work, put the hard top on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, oh, for the October 8th meeting, same meeting number and password? No, we will be sending out a new invite for that. Uh, so make sure that you keep an eye out for the official NBCA email regarding that event. It will be a new meeting number and password. Um, Okay, for older cars that have cracks in plastic or rubber, what is your opinion on keeping the original parts or replacing them with aftermarket since MB does not produce the parts anymore? Yes, uh, that, that is something that I'm facing in restoring my 201. Uh, a lot of those parts are no longer available. Thanks, Mercedes. Um, so where deductions are taken, um, it, it depends. It depends on if you can find an aftermarket replacement. If you can, then it is sometimes better to take the deduction for something being aftermarket than it is to take the deduction for something being cracked or broken. Uh, that will receive, even if it's OE, it, that could receive a bigger deduction than something being aftermarket and in perfect condition, especially if the part is no longer available for Mercedes. Judges are much more understanding um, for that scenario. Perfect example was 201 windshields. They're no longer, they, they weren't available. So you had to go with an aftermarket windshield. Uh, in that situation, it's better to show up with an aftermarket windshield than it is to show up with a windshield with spider cracks all over it. I mean, that, that's a perfect example of that. Um, I would, I would show up with the aftermarket versus versus the uh, original broken part. Again, that depends on what the part is. Um, I mean, if it's a crack also, in the dash, if it's a if it's a crack in the dashboard, I mean, if the car is like a sixty euros car, I mean, that's also where we get into the situation where we can call it patina. I personally don't have. If the car is 30 years old and it's got a small few cracks developing around in some plastic areas of the dash, I'm okay with it personally. Yes, will it, will it end up being, if they see it, will it be a quarter point deduction? Probably. Is it gonna make the difference between your car placing first versus second? Possibly, but again, the idea is the best car wins. Um, that's an awful lot of work to find I'm not, I mean, I'm not so sure I'd be changing a dash on a 60, like a 1965 car. Um, I don't think I'd do it personally. I mean, unless it's a giant crack uh, or unless you get, you know, if you, I would, it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna be look, keeping my eyes out on the secondhand market because you might get lucky eventually 
And if you are able to find that dash that's not cracked, absolutely, you, absolutely, then you buy it. But um, sometimes you just have to live with what you have. I mean, I know my cars pretty well. I know where my deductions are. I don't voluntarily give, tell the judges what's wrong with my car because that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. But, uh, uh, you know, no car's perfect. I mean, my cars aren't perfect. I, I do the best I can, I do the best with what I have. And then I present the car the way it is. And, you know, I kind of hope for the best. And Jeff's saying this as somebody who's won best of show twice. So, you know, he, he, he does know a thing or two of what he's talking about. And a lot of this, um, how to prepare and show, like how to actually prepare your car uh, and present your car will be going, uh, gone through in much more detail in the second part of our class. We did want to address a few of these questions now just because they are here but we will be going into a lot greater detail of how to choose uh, what to address and what to leave as is, depending on your, your time, your resources, money, uh, money being a, resource, a particular resource, but also your, your knowledge and your skill level, what um, external resources you have available to you. Um, the availability of parts and stuff like that. Part two of our class really focuses in on uh, how to address particular issues to, to minimize your deductions. Um, let's see if we have Nancy, Jeff's 16 valve is magnificent. Thank you. If, if that's who I think it is, Nancy, thank you for joining us. I believe I know who you are. I don't want to, um, I'm pretty sure I know who you are. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm so happy you're here. It's good to to see you virtually again. Um, if we have any other questions at this point, um, please put them in the chat or if you want to um, chime in, you can unmute yourself and actually chat with us if you have particular questions about anything that we went over today. If you have any questions about what's going to be in the next class, again, it's going to be October 8th, uh, which is again a Thursday. Um, at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. In the meantime, we do have another class that's going to be uh, next Thursday. Uh, Pierre has been dedicating a lot of time to us. He's been donating a lot of his time presenting fuel injection presentations. We did K-Jetronic and K-E-Jetronic. And uh, those two classes are available on our YouTube channel search MBCA and then uh, events and section resources. That is um, events and member resources, sorry. That's, those videos are on there. Uh, but our Pierre is going to be presenting a class next Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific on diesel fuel injection. Anne-Marie, uh, it's not, Anne-Marie, it's not yeah. diesel, it's DJetronic. DJetronic, sorry, I had my info wrong. Thank you, Pierre. Djetronic. Why does it say diesel on there? Did I read that wrong? That might say diesel on the website. We need to change that. No, Andrew looked. It's it's Djetronic. We okay. made sure. Perfect. I had I had my info wrong. Then I had my notes wrong from from a few weeks ago. Uh, but yes, we do have another iteration of that. Um, and then we have, again, our presentation on the 8th. If you have any requests for classes that you want to see uh, or you want us to provide to you, or if you know somebody who is an expert in a particular field who wants to present a class, please email us. We are always looking for better content, more content, different ideas, different people. I'm sure you guys don't want to see me every week on here. Um, this is the first time I've actually presented a class, but I've moderated the last couple. Uh, so we, we want new faces on here. We want other people showing up too. So if you know somebody who is an expert in a particular field who, is, who would like to uh, present a class on Zoom uh, in the fall or in, during the winter months, we are definitely open to having other people on here. Email us at um, Social media, or, yeah, social media at nbca.org. Andrew is the head of our social media committee. He manages that email account. He is also on here, so he can shoot that into the chat. 
um, what, what, our, what our email address is, that goes to the social media committee directly. It doesn't go to the, um, to the, to the board or to other people to where they have to forward it to us. No, that goes to us directly. So you can let us know what, what type of classes you're, you're interested in, what kind of content you're looking for. Um, we have some pretty exciting things coming up that we don't have completely locked down, but we have some pretty exciting stuff coming up. So I hope that you join us. Um, if that is it for the questions. Oh, thank you, George. I appreciate that. Um, if that is it for tonight, then we will say goodbye. I hope that you can join us for our next class and um, let us know what you thought. Thank you. Good night.